Well, good morning. It's time to get started with our class this morning. If you would be opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, this morning we're going to begin our study in verse 42. Acts 2, 42. David Burkhart, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the many things that you give us, the blessings of this day, the blessings of life, the blessing of your love, Father. We pray today, Father, that you be with us, watch over us, and guide us as we go through our service today. Father, we are thankful for being able to come together here this morning to study more of your word, to grow in the Christian fellowship. Well, in Acts chapter 2, really beginning in verse 41 and going down through the end of the chapter, we find a description of the very early days of the church. Verse 41 talks about the culmination of the day of Pentecost and how those who gladly received the word, they were baptized and were added to the church. And we're told that about 3,000 souls were added to the church on that day. But then as we come into verse 42 and down through the end of the chapter, what we find, as I said, is a description of some of the practices of this early church, the way that they conducted themselves, the things that were important to them, and the things that led to the church in those very early days growing as rapidly as it did. So let's begin by looking at verse 42. And they, this is talking about those who were added to the church, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Last week I spoke just briefly with David following class about an interesting, uh, an interesting incident that I came about in some of my... Uh, church history research that pertains to this verse. And what it is, it's a, it's a seldom practiced idea today, and it's one that is really not very well known by many people in the church anymore. But back in the 1920s and 30s, there was an idea that came out of Acts 2 and verse 42 that led to a lot of issues and even led to some division within the body of Christ. And what it held was that Acts 2.42 sets out an exact divinely sanctioned order of the worship service. Now what we find in this verse shows us exactly how everything has to be carried out or our worship to God is unacceptable. Well, the first man to propose this idea was named F.W. Emmons. F.W. Emmons lived in Virginia, and he was a Baptist preacher, became very popular in that religious group. But around the year 1830, he came into contact with some of the writings of the early Restoration leaders in this country, men like Alexander Campbell, Walter Scott, and some of the others. And very quickly, he saw the error of his ways, and he began to practice and teach New Testament Christianity. Well, over time he became a close acquaintance with some of these early leaders, became a very close friend with Alexander Campbell. Uh, 
Uh, In fact, some of you may be familiar with the book The Living Oracles, which is a translation of the New Testament, which Alexander Campbell uh, translated. Well, F.W. Emmons was one of the editors of that work that assisted him in that work. But in 1837, just seven years after becoming a Christian, F.W. Emmons, he wrote a book entitled A Discourse on the Ancient Order of Things and the Worship of the Christian Congregation. And in this book, he argued that Acts 2.42 gives us an exact order of worship that cannot be deviated from in any way if we want our worship to be acceptable. Now, I'm sure that all of us have visited in other congregations from time to time, and we see that in every congregation that we visit, that worship service is going to follow a slightly different order. All of those mandated acts of worship are going to be carried out, but they may not be carried out in the exact same way, in the exact same order. Each congregation will conduct those acts of worship as determined by the leaders of that congregation. Some will begin with prayer, others begin with a song, some have the Lord's Supper before the sermon, some have the Lord's Supper last. But if what F.W. Emmons says is true, then there's only one way that we can conduct the worship service. Emmons says, Acts 2.42 says that singing has to take place first. Since singing is a form of teaching, it would fall under the heading of the Apostles' Doctrine. Preaching then must come next. Then he looks at this term fellowship. And by his estimation, the term fellowship is equated with the contribution He says, fellowship is contribution. Then you have the Lord's Supper, and finally you conclude the worship service in prayer. And if you deviate from that order in any way, then you are breaking God's prescribed pattern. Well, initially hardly anyone accepted that view. It was uh, was, uh, discredited very quickly by most of the preachers of the day. But while... Brother Emmons held this view. He didn't make it a test of fellowship. But that all changed in the 1920s and 30s. In the 1920s and 30s, there was a man by the name of J.D. Phillips. J.D. Phillips came along and he resurrected this view. But he, along with another man named W.J. Rice, made this a test of fellowship. They said, if the congregation does not worship in this way, it is sinful And they cannot be fellowshipped by any other brethren. Well, the reason that I mention all of this partially is because this man, J.D. Phillips, has a tie to northeast Arkansas. J.D. Phillips was born in Yaleville, Arkansas, and he began preaching as a teenager. He was baptized by another preacher that many of you have probably heard of, Rue Porter. He was baptized at the age of 16. And he began preaching all over northeast Arkansas. He attended County Line Bible School, which was a very uh, popular school of the day that was located up north of Viola. But Brother Phillips soon came into conflict with S.C. Garner, who was the director of that school, because Brother Phillips maintained the view that only one cup was to be used in the observance of the Lord's Supper. Well... This opposition soon led to his departure from that school. But again, the reason that I mentioned J.D. Phillips is if you read some of the things that have been written about him, one of the things that I came across was the fact that he preached extensively in Randolph County, Arkansas. And so there is the possibility that many of the congregations here in our county were influenced, at least in small part, by this man in the very early days of his ministry. Well, continuing on, eventually he made his way to Texas, and there he continued to uh, promote this view, which eventually got to the point where only about 25 congregations uh, accepted this and made it a test of fellowship. But the thing that I want us to keep in mind when we look at this, there is nothing at all in this verse that tells us that this is a prescribed order. 
What we find here is simply a general listing of the things that this congregation was involved in. Now, I think it is a stretch if we look at this and we try to say this idea of the apostles' doctrine involves singing and preaching. I think it's a stretch for us to look at the term fellowship and try to say that this is referring to the contribution. I don't think that's what this is referring to at all. But what we need to keep in mind is while this listing does involve some of the things that take place when we come together to worship God, it is not giving us an exact order of the way these things have to be done. So let's look at this next section of verses, beginning here in verse 42. Notice it starts out, says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The King James Version says that they continued steadfastly. But when we look at the original Greek rendering of this statement, it literally says they were addicted to the apostles' doctrine. Now the way that we would take that today, they could not get enough of it. We think about someone who has an addiction in their life. It's something that they yearn for. It's something that they have to have. It's something that they hurt if they're not able to have it. Well, that's the picture that Luke is painting here of the way that these early Christians felt about the Word of God. They were addicted to it. They yearned for it. They had to have it. These people had made a complete turn from their old way of life, and they wanted to learn as much as they possibly could about this new way of life. Ultimately, they were addicted to being taught. They were seizing every opportunity that they could to hear the Word of God. They were excited any time that they had an opportunity to learn. I can imagine and and picture in my mind that in those early days, any time that they heard that one of the apostles was going to be teaching, you would have a, a, a mass mob of people that were going, trying to get to where this teaching was going to take place. They wanted to hear the Word. They wanted to learn from it. They couldn't get enough of it. And they wanted to be with God's people. And I think this hungering and thirsting after righteousness, hungering and thirsting after the Word of God, is something that is somewhat lacking with many people today. Here we have a powerful example of those who, as we might say, were still drip-drying on the edge of the Jerusalem baptistry, but they could not get enough of the Word of God. They were soaking in as much as they possibly could. Next, we see the word fellowship. This is indicating not, as we talked about a while ago, this idea of the contribution, but this is talking about the attitude that they had toward one another. They wanted to be with each other. They recognized the significance of being with brothers and sisters in Christ and the fellowship that they had in the family of God. They wanted to be together. And they took every opportunity they had to be together. And I think to an extent we can understand this as well. We probably all have Christian friends that we enjoy being with. I know many Christians who will eat together on a regular basis. They'll vacation together. I've heard of Christians that would even uh, buy homes beside each other because they wanted to make sure that, that they were around those who were of like precious faith, around those that could be a good influence upon them. They had been saved by the blood of Christ and they recognized the significance of that new relationship they were in. And so they wanted to be with their brothers and sisters. But then... And this is, in my opinion, where we really get to a description of the worship of the early church. Notice it says, the breaking of bread. Well, they recognize the importance of observing the Lord's Supper. Now, when we look at the New Testament, we find that there are two different Greek words that are often translated break bread or the breaking of bread. One of those is the Greek word Eucharista, which is where uh, the Catholic Church and uh, Episcopal Church, some of the others, get their term the Eucharist, which is what they refer to as the Lord's Supper. Anytime you find that term used in the Scriptures, you know that it's in reference to the Lord's Supper. But then you find another Greek term, 
that's talking about a common meal. And we see oftentimes in the scriptures this idea of breaking bread together, referring to having a common meal. And I know several years ago, uh, especially back when I was in college, there was a movement, and it never really gained much traction, and I'm glad it didn't, but there was this idea in the Lord's church that the Lord's Supper should always be observed as as a part of a common meal. And they looked at the example of Jesus instituting it during the Passover. They looked at the example there in Corinth of where really the Lord's Supper was being abused because it was a part of a common meal. And they began to promote this idea that every Lord's Day, every congregation should enjoy a common meal together. And I know there's some of us here that wouldn't object to that. But they should enjoy a common meal together and then at some point in that meal you should stop and partake of the Lord's Supper. But when you get into the scriptures and you really dig into what is said in the original language, you see two entirely different concepts there. The Lord's Supper is separate and apart from a common meal. And so whenever we look at this statement in Acts 2.42, this is that term, Eucharistia or Eucharista. It's the term referring to the partaking of the Lord's Supper. The early church that shows us that they were continuing in that pattern that Jesus had set forth. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And it was something that they continued to do every Lord's Day when they came together. They were doing this as Jesus commanded. Any questions or comments up to this point? Y'all don't have to be so quiet, you know. Notice next it says that they involved themselves in prayer. They were a prayerful people. They appreciated the power and the privilege that comes through the avenue of of prayer. And this is one of those areas where I think sometimes we neglect this gift that we have. As children of God, we are the only ones that have the promise of being able to communicate with God this way. The scriptures tell us that God does not hear the prayers of a sinner. He does not answer the prayers of a sinner. We're told that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous person availeth much. There's a power, there's a privilege there of being able to come before the throne of God with our prayers and make our petitions known unto Him. But so often this is a gift that is neglected. But can we ever reach the point that we pray too much? I don't think so. No. The early church, we're told, they continued in prayer. This is an ongoing action that they were involved in. They were continually in prayer to God. Now I want you to think with me for just a moment. The Apostle Paul, in just about every one of the epistles that he wrote, you notice he requests the prayers of the people on his behalf. But also, in most of the epistles that he writes, he tells them that He is in prayer for them, indicating the significance of this, the importance of prayer. We see this in his statement in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, that we are to pray without ceasing, meaning live a life that is devoted to prayer, one that is, is ready and willing to speak to God in prayer at a moment's notice. All right, any questions on 42 before we move into 43? Yes, sir. What about the, uh, when the Bible says that we all sin, what does that mean? Does that mean that when it says that you won't answer a sinner's prayer, he's talking about someone that has never, never obeyed God? That's right. Someone who's lost. But, you know, Don, also throw in there that he would also be referring to someone who's living in willful sin. Because we look at Hebrews chapter 10 and what does it tell us? It tells us that if you are living in willful sin, even if you are a child of God, you have no more sacrifice for sin. You've lost the benefits of your salvation. So, yes, every person, it doesn't matter how good of a life that you're living, how strong of a Christian you are, 
you're going to have times that you slip up and fall short of the glory of God. That doesn't mean that God is not going to hear your prayer if you pray to him and ask for him to forgive you. But like Don said, this is talking about one who has never obeyed the gospel. One who has never gained access to the avenue of prayer. But also, this would refer to one who has rejected their faith. One who has uh, gone back to living in willful sin. Yes, sir. That entailed... He would never hear a sinner's prayer that Don the words lost because I've got no way when I sin I've got no way to go to him and ask for forgiveness. If That's right. Not hear it, not act on it. That's right. So it has to be those who are outside who have never obeyed the gospel, who have never accepted him and done his will. That's right. That's right. Okay, verse forty three. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. When it says that fear came upon every soul, a better word that we could put there is awe came upon every soul. You know, generally when we think about the word fear, we think about that in a negative sense. I'm afraid of something. I'm afraid of snakes. You may be afraid of spiders or frogs or the dark or storms or whatever the case may be, whatever phobia it is. That may be in your life. That is a fear that you have, and that's seen in a negative sense. But this term that is translated fear can also be translated respect, but it can also be translated awe. And whenever we look at the context of this verse, I think awe is a much better way of looking at this because if you notice, it tells us that they were seeing things, they were experiencing things, that they had never seen before. That human eyes had never seen, human ears had never heard. These were things that were beyond their comprehension. They were in awe of what they were experiencing. The power of God that was working through the apostles by the way of these signs and these wonders. It caused people to be amazed at this. Amazed at what they were seeing and hearing. Another good word there is reverence. That's right. Um, and reverence is more than respect. Reverence is, is it's a respect, but it's a devotion. It's it's uh, many times when the scripture says they feared God, it meant that they had great reverence for God. That's right. Not not just your typical respect, but great reverence. A That's right. Type of feeling. That's right. Absolutely. You try to put yourself in the shoes of these Christians in those days. And you try to imagine what it would be like to witness the things that we're told the apostles were doing. As Don just said, you know, we, we can't do it. It's something that we've never seen. Yes, we read about it in the scriptures. Yes, we accept it based upon our faith. But we can't imagine that. We can't imagine what it would be like to see someone uh, miraculously healed from some type of crippling disability. We can't imagine what it would be like to see someone raised from the dead. We can't imagine what it would be like to see someone that you know does not speak a certain language suddenly be able to speak that fluently. We can't imagine that. And, And that is why... They stood in awe of what they were seeing. And and as David mentioned, it caused them to have this reverence for God because they recognized that that was the power of God that was was working through the apostles. That's right. That's right. Now, we understand, we've, we've talked quite extensively in the past, so we won't go too far into it today. The purpose of those miracles was very temporary. And it was essentially to get the church off and running. To establish faith in the message that was being proclaimed. To show those individuals that were hearing these things that this truly is the Word of God. You truly do need to place your faith in these things. 
But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us that there would become a time when those things wouldn't be needed anymore. When that which is perfect has come. We read through the scriptures, what is the only thing that God's word refers to as being perfect? Itself. God's word refers to itself as being perfect. Now, certainly, you know, we could look at the scriptures and we could make the argument, was Jesus perfect? Yes. Was this world perfect before sin entered in? Yes. Our little children who have not reached the age of accountability, are they in a perfect state? Yes. But the only thing that the Bible explicitly states as being perfect is itself. The perfect law of liberty. When that which is perfect is come, these things that are in part, these miracles, these prophecies, the ability to speak in tongues, the ability to cast out devils, all of these miraculous things were going to come to an end. Because as Danny referenced just a moment ago, the time was going to come when basically our righteousness, our faith, or our acceptance by God was going to be based upon our faith and not by our sight. Not by the things that we were seeing and witnessing with human eyes, but by the faith that we place in his word. What does Romans, uh, what's Romans tell us? That faith cometh by what? By hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Not by witnessing miracles. Faith cometh by the word of God. We place our faith in God's word. And as Danny referenced, we will be blessed by that. Any questions or comments? Well, the word is perfect in that there's no error in it, but it's also perfect in that it's complete. That's right. A lot of times the Bible uses that word perfect to mean it's complete. And I think that really applies here because he tells us in Revelation not to add to or take away. He, this is complete. This is the final will and testament. Has no error, it is complete. That's right. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 actually uses the terminology, these things which are in part, things that are incomplete. And so, yes, when that complete revelation of God's word has come to man, then those things would not be needed any longer. Their purpose would be fulfilled. Well, you know, we talked about prayer being a necessity. When the apostles asked Christ to teach them to pray, as John did, his apostles, and during his prayer, he said, I pray uh, not the only, but for all those who believe on his word. And that's me and you today, Josh. And those who are on the earth, those who will yet to come, if the Lord lets them. That's right. We're following him with that faith that they had in Jesus. The apostles had, the early Christians had. Because I've never seen him. No, I won't in this life. That's right. Because he prayed, though, but for us, to be strong in the faith, to believe in them on the words that they preach. And that's me and you today. That's right. Sometimes we forget about uh, Christ's action in our lives today. That's right. And you know something that we referenced last week, whenever you look at those on the day of Pentecost, what was it that motivated them to change? What does Acts 2.37 say? What was it that pricked the heart? It was the word that Peter had spoke. Those who, what? Who gladly received the word. Not those who were moved by the miracles. Not those who were intrigued by what they were seeing. But those who gladly received the word. Those were the ones who obtained salvation. Those were the ones who obeyed the gospel, who, were, who repented and were baptized. Those were the ones who were added to the church not those who were moved by miracles or intrigued by those miracles. Same thing's happening to people today who obey the gospel. They're moved by the word. That's right. Not by any miracle they ever heard of. They didn't see a miracle, but any miracle they ever heard. That's They're right. They're moved by God's word even today. That's right. You know, something else that we forget sometimes is the setting. In the early church, there were many 
antichrist. There were many false teachers. They came along and said they were Christ. But people had to know something about who really was Christ and who were Christ's apostles. And that's one of the biggest reasons they were given the ability to perform miracles. It's like you say, the words what convicted people, not the miracles. The miracles proved that they were not antichrists, that they were not false teachers. They were the truth. That's right. That's right. That The way I've always looked at it is, is the miracles got their attention and got them to pay attention to the word. It convinced them, you know what, these are the workers of God. This is the message of God coming forth from them. Maybe we need to pay attention to this. But the miracles themselves is not what moved people to change. It was the word. Okay. Verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common. Well, this idea of all things common, this idea of a common salvation, a common love, a common fellowship that they had with each other, led them to have a benevolent spirit toward each other. They were not looking at their own possessions as something that was important to them, something that they were going to retain. If they saw a brother or sister who was in need, then they were willing to do whatever it took to provide for that need. It's kind of like we talked about from uh, Philippians chapter 3, where Paul was talking about, you know, all of the things that he had going for him before he became a Christian, you know, he he considered those of no value. Those were things that he was willing to give up in order to serve God. But now notice in this passage it talks about the fact that they had all things in common. They looked at what they had and they recognized that if it was something that could be used to the benefit of someone else that they were willing to allow that. Because to them the most important thing at this point was their faith and this Christian family that they had. But, you know, too often I think we develop this mindset that, you know, benevolent works are going to cost too much, they're going to be too time-consuming, that they're not going to accomplish any kind of evangelistic effort, that people are going to take advantage of us. You know, we've heard all the excuses. Maybe we've made some of the excuses. But here we see a powerful example of these individuals who recognized the need that could be done by assisting one another. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind is that in Jerusalem, after the day of Pentecost, you had many people, well, even even prior to the day of Pentecost, you had many people there that Jerusalem was not their home. They had come there to celebrate the Passover, and as we talked quite extensively, they then would stay for those days between, uh, between the Passover and Pentecost. This was known as the time of waiting or the days of waiting. And then usually after the day of Pentecost, they would return home. How many of those people do you think wanted to return home after they experienced the day of Pentecost? Probably not very many. They wanted to stay there because why? Because they wanted to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They wanted to continue in that fellowship that they had with each other. They wanted to learn more. And so you had people there who were away from home. You had people there who uh, needed places to stay, needed to be provided for with the necessities of life. And so the brethren in Jerusalem... They were willing to provide for those needs, for those individuals. We need to understand, and and of course, in this passage, we're not talking about benevolent assistance to those who are non-Christians. You know, that's another subject for another time. We're talking about benevolent assistance for those who are children of God. And I don't know this for certain, but I would say that there's probably not ever been a time that one of the members of this congregation needed assistance that we didn't try to help them in some way, David. Because we recognize the importance of that. Providing for one another. And we see that example. 
set forth here in the very early days of the church. So what did they do? How did they provide for each other? Well, verse 45 says they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. The best example that I can think of of this is in Acts 4, verses 36 and 37. We see a man by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas had a piece of property. And this piece of property he recognized was not really benefiting him in any way. And so he took, he sold that property. And he brought the proceeds and gave it to the apostles to provide for the needs of these needy saints. In contrast, though, we see the example in Acts 5 of Ananias and Sapphira. Was there, just on the surface, was there really anything wrong with them not giving all of the proceeds? No. Where the problem arose was when they came and they lied about it. They said, well, we've sold a piece of land, and look, we've, we've brought everything that we've made, and we're bringing it to you. Well, no, they didn't. They kept some of it back. And as a result, we know they lost their life as a result of it. But it shows that they didn't have the same degree of devotion that Barnabas did. Now, also, it could possibly be that Barnabas had received some praise because of this. It could have been that it was announced in the congregation. You know, Brother Barnabas has provided in this way. We appreciate the gift. You know, we've done things like that before. Someone make a donation to the church, and we recognize that. It's not to bring any praise to them, but just to express appreciation for what they've done. But it may be that Ananias and Sapphira saw this, and they thought, well, this is causing Barnabas to look good to the people. We want some of that praise for ourselves. And that selfishness led them to taking the action that they took. And they lost their life as a result of it. But we have Barnabas who continued to show that encouraging spirit. In fact, he came to be referred to as the son of encouragement. Because here was a man who was always trying to find ways to be of assistance to his brethren, to encourage his brethren. And so... The example that we see here, when these brethren had things that really weren't benefiting them, and they saw a need there, they were willing to let go of those things in order to provide for the needs of others. Now, this does not mean, as some very radical teachers have promoted in the past, that every Christian is supposed to live in poverty. It does not mean, as some radical teachers have promoted in the past, that we're to sell everything that we have, we're to put it into the treasury and basically become the ward of the church. That's not what this is saying at all. We still have the responsibility to provide for ourselves, to provide for our families, but this is talking about when we have an overabundance. Something that, you know, it's not benefiting us in any way, but we see a way that it could benefit someone else. We should have a desire to assist that person any way that we can. You know, Josh, I've heard some people teach this from the perspective that it's, it's wrong to have wealth and all that, but that's not that's, that's the whole thing. It is. The point here is if God's blessed you with more and your brother in Christ has a need, a real need, you need to make sure. If I knew Don needed something badly and he didn't have the money, I should feel out of my love for him and my love for God to try to help God. That's right. That's that's the lesson he's getting across, but I've heard a lot of preachers try to put people on guilt trips about things. That's not what God's teaching here. No, it's not. It's not. And you know, we find we find examples of those in the scriptures who were very poor. We find examples of those who were very wealthy. And oftentimes people will look at the example of the rich young man that came to Jesus and Jesus told him, you know, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Well, then they'll take that and they'll make the argument, well, you see right there, it shows that you're not supposed to be wealthy. Now, why was it he was told that? Because his trust was in wealth. His devotion was to that wealth. His lust was after that wealth. 
And in order for him to be able to become a faithful child of God, that was what he had to turn loose of. But it's not saying that it's a sin to be wealthy. It's not saying that whatsoever. But, you know, also on the opposite spectrum, you have those that promote this idea that the more faithful you are, the more wealthy you're going to be. Well, there's nothing in the Bible whatsoever that talks about that that wealth or poverty has anything to do with our faithfulness to God. Now, some of the most faithful Christians I've known in my life live from paycheck to paycheck, barely got by. But on the other hand, I've known some very, very strong Christians who were very blessed in life, who were wealthy. But they used what they had to benefit others. And so really, it all comes down to this, you know, this idea. People oftentimes want to misinterpret the scripture and say that money is the root of all evil. But it's the love of money. The devotion to that money. That's the root of all evil. That's what's sinful. Okay, any questions or comments? Because we are, actually, we're past time. So... These people who advocate selling everything. Have you ever seen anybody do it, Josh? Sell everything down and give it to the church? 